everyone. Uh, uh, thank you for coming. So today I'll be talking about Chinese web views. Um, now I feel like I come from a very different universe, but um, I hope that the, the, the kind of empirical research on Chinese web views can help us rethink the user and how to uh, better design research to understand uh, user behavior and the consequences of uh, certain user uh, usage patterns. So um, my research looks at the connections between emerging technologies and cultural change, and I'm particularly interested in web use, uh, which I approach as kind of uh, socially constituted ways in which people encounter and engage uh, media and technological environments. So I'm a mixed method person. Um, today I'll talk about two studies. One is um, a quantitative um, macro pattern study. The other is a qualitative micro processes um, study. So to be begin, um, I want to highlight two seemingly contradictory features uh, of the Chinese internet. The first is, of course, censorship. Uh, Chinese censorship has always attracted much international attention, and we need to know that uh, the regulations of online information here is not just by any government, but by the world's, the world's largest authoritarian regime. So in terms of actual measures, there are two types. Uh, one is content censorship that's exercised on domestic sites, and for problematic foreign sites that falls out of, outside of the state jurisdiction, uh, you have the internet fury system, also known as China's Great Firewall, um, or the GFW. So it prevents China-based users from accessing these sites. But meanwhile, a usually overlooked fact is that the Chinese internet accommodates abundant information, both by volume and by diversity. So the Chinese state, while strengthening control over this new media, um, has also been taking a very aggressive role in expanding internet infrastructures and the information economy. So for a decade, China has had the world's largest online population. The latest number is a staggering total of 773, uh, 72 million. Um, so the Chinese internet is a self-sufficient web ecology, um, consisting of sites addressing full spectrum of everyday needs. In this universe, the stuff one can find is very diverse. In terms of political information, many empirical studies have documented the production and circulation of online content that's critical of the government and of other dominant ideologies. So the most widely cited work is probably by um, the, uh, the analysis of massive Weibo chess by Gary King and his team at Harvard. So they found that the censors remove messages that organize collective action, but they do not really react much to uh, messages that criticize the government. Um, therefore, in terms of information landscape, the Chinese internet actually qualifies as a high-choice media environment. And the term high-choice media environment um, is a term that usually reserved for digital environments um, in liberal democracies. So the next overarching point in my talk is that when we talk about media, we make very latent um, assumptions about the user. A specific user figure is mobilized to dominance because it addresses some deeper crisis or longing. And perhaps nothing can illustrate better than um, examining two different bodies of literature on the Chinese internet. So the first we have domestically produced in liter uh, literature within China. So the internet there is seen as this uh, thing that the government puts to work as the centerpiece of the country's economic development. So here you see a lot of numbers, graphs, policy initiatives, and occasionally some uh, reports on public opinion that supports all this. Um, human faces are generally lacking in this body of literature. And this lack of agentic user actually reflects on spoken fear of the disturbances or divergence from state-planned um, development of China's information economy. So in contrast to that, um, when we look at the literature produced in the West, the internet is considered as means to promote resistance in China, an exhilarating ingredient in the ongoing contention between state and society, and here the same theme reiterates itself. The oppressed user actively appropriate new technologies to challenge and overcome external political constraints. And first, the technology was online forum, and then blogs, and microblogs, or Weibo. This assumes a self-propelled liberal subject independent of her past, always ready to function as an ideal citizen in liberal democracy. And this user figure dominant this Western literature because 
um, there is a definitive vision for China's political future, which is formal uh, democracy. And also there's a conviction that uh, information technologies would play a crucial role in um, fulfilling, um, achieving this future. So uh, the first study I'll talk about now directly addresses a problem of projecting such a Chinese web user. And this study questioned the purported balkanizing effect of China's Great Firewall. Um, this study belongs to the a longer project that Harsh and I has been uh, working on, um, and he just presented before me, and he you know, went into detail about the rationale and benefits of analyzing passively measured uh, web usage data, and he also introduced some uh, basic uh, the approach to construct the web as a shared um, traffic network. So I just go ahead to provide you the motivation of our study, a very simple outline, and to discuss the implications of the findings. That, you know, that might you know, um, remind you of this stuff. So what is the motivation? The US policy and popular discourses about global internet has this uh, preoccupation with technical connectivity, which Harz also talked about. So in this dominant view, the internet is a global uh, borderless space, and the obstacle, the main obstacle um, to its realization um, is access blockage practiced by uh, various non-democratic uh, states, for example, China. And this dominant vision is perfectly illustrated by this very widely circulated post from Journalists Without Borders, um, which looks pretty much um, pretty similar to the other widely circulated uh, user map of Facebook, a site that was blocked in China. So in this dominant discourse, the GFW, the Great Firewall, is often equated as this digital version of Iron Curtain, um, that curbs free flow of information online. And presumably it stops the Chinese from joining the world, from embracing the values of li liberty and democracy, and in turn from uh, pushing for democratization, right? And accordingly, much research has focused on how the Chinese manage to breach the wall, technically, to reach um, to the uh, downside, so to speak. And all this emphasizes the coercive impact of the Great Firewall, which involves the underlying assumption of the Chinese web user. So this Chinese user, with the GFW in her way, um, seeks to overcome it. So that, that's kind of the user figure that's assumed, um, that, that's underlying this type of research. So what it is missing, both these images and also the dominant discourse, um, is the kind of local user activity and local content um, that's why a lot of in those black holes, right? Um, so to put this dominant view out of scrutiny, we have this uh, large-scale empirical study to to look at what users actually do um, over there. So very briefly, we have three types of data, uh, the traffic um, data from Comscore, and then we have human coding of the languages and geographic focus on all these sites, and we're looking at global sites. Um, and then we have a third part of data, uh, which is the blockage records from Great Firewall. Uh, GreatFire.org is online, um, uh, organization that tracks and testifies, tests and tracks uh, the kind of websites that the Great Firewall has been uh, blocking. So we constructed the global uh, web as uh, traffic network and then we did hierarchical clustering to identify the major uh, regional cultures online. Uh, we also calculated uh, group closeness centrality to see how distant each online regional culture is from the rest of the web. So what we found here is that China is just one of those regional cultures and is by no means the most distant uh, among all the uh, major regional cultures we found online. So the, this result here does not, um, should not come as a surprise after Harsh's talk, uh, although chrono chronologically we published the study before our more systematic efforts to map um, the global web usage. So then we contrasted the website's blockage records with these sites' cultural proximity to the Chinese users. And, and then for um, limited time, I will um, not uh, go into detail in terms of the detailed analysis, but I'll be happy to talk about it if anyone is interested uh, after all this. So what we found is that regardless of blockage, none of the culturally distant sites uh, really made it into the Chinese cluster. So. Well, so we can say that on a macro level, the GFW has minimal coercive impact on Chinese web usage, 
and the Chinese cluster forms largely due to cultural proximity, just like other online regional cultures. So what does this say? So seeing technical blockage as external <coughs> coercion comes from the normative proscriptions in classical liberalism, right? So this preoccupation with technical connectivity comes with a particular projection about the user. And our large-scale empirical study questions not only the projection about the Chinese user, who you know, they're supposed to always overcome the technical connectivity that's set up, set up by political power, but also through international comparison, we also reveal something about the user in the free world. Um, the way they navigate and inhabit the culturally familiar parts of the internet um, is no different from that of the Chinese uh, users. And then we move to the second study. Um, this one I'll talk about explores the lived experiences of Chinese web users whose online journeys were hijacked by online censorship. And this study is part of the book uh, that I'm developing. As I have already discussed, in the existing literature um, on Chinese web use, either there is no agentic user or there is a preformed liberal user. So neither can capture the user's transformation. And then accordingly, the, can, cannot really capture the emergence of new culture, new values through media use or web use uh, in China. So this was the starting point of my project. I was interested in the micro processes whereby people develop alternative political beliefs through media practices. And I found that, um, which I believe applies to contexts beyond China, so I found that in high choice media environments, it's not the access to alternative information, but the ways in which people habitually choose and interpret media that results in the transformation of their existing beliefs. So this research draws from anthropographic observation and oral history interviews of users who experience substantial changes in their political beliefs um, over time. So the, is, uh, specifically, I focus on users that gathered around the site called Bulog. It's a flagship website that were unmistakably critical of China's official political culture. So this is a blogging platform hosting dozens of charismatic bloggers that you see here, they're from different walks of life um, on the faces. And then after two and a half years online, in early 2009, so the site was shut down by the Chinese government, so it wasn't there anymore. So in late 2012 and early 2013, I uh, kind of conducted oral history interviews with 26 former avid readers of blog in nine different Chinese cities. I showed up in venues that these individuals picked as a total stranger, and then they told me about their personal histories for one and a half or three hours. So I can tell you later on exactly how I found and identified these people and convinced them to do that. But my focus here in the oral history interviews are these individuals' longitudinal um, engagement with the internet, um, as well as their interactions with other media, both before and after the advent of the internet. So now I'll discuss a particular kind of brainwashing phenomenon, kind of a brainwashing paranoia that I noticed among my interviewees. So if you examine online texts, this, there is evidence that this paranoia also pervades a segment, a very sig significant segment of the Chinese internet. So the term brainwashing um, was first used by Americans during the Korean War. Um, it was initially a psychological term that de describes methodologies of coercive persuasion employed under the Maoist regime. Uh, it comes from the Chinese phrase xinao, literally means man cleanse. And now it's part of our daily language. Uh, we use it to explain how an undesirable mindset comes into being due to powerful external forces, especially the media. For example, there's a book entitled um, Obama Zombies, How the Liberal Machine Brainwashed My Generation. So in recent years, brainwashing has become a buzzword in the Chinese language sphere as well. So protests over school brainwashing broke out first in Hong Kong in 2012 and then in Taiwan in 2015. So both were against proposed uh, textbook and booklet edits. So the protesters believe that these edits would implant identification within, uh, with China uh, in the minds of their younger generations. 
and beyond worrying about their children's um, vulnerability, some Hong Kongers and Taiwanese uh, also consider people from mainland China brainwashed um, because of their isolation within the Great Firewall. And they would invoke this conception when they encounter and get into arguments <coughs> with mainland Chinese on the internet. So the categorical difference between these scenarios, um, these are protests, and what I've observed in my study among uh, the Chinese web users is that in the latter case, people believe they themselves have been brainwashed. So, uh, so especially, I'm oh, sorry, the wrong one second. Um, uh, to show why this phenomenon is theoretically interesting, I consider this brainwashing paranoia, a form of lay media theory, or folk media theories. Um, it's kind of durable, experientially based idea that ordinary people hold about media. So although such ideas often lack scientific basis, they have concrete influences on people's actions. So the literature in communication and media studies, including quantitative media effect studies and ethnographic audience, audience research, has documented many cases about ordinary people's perceptions and ideas about media. Um, and these cases largely fall under two categories. The first is perceived media bias, um, and the second one is uh, beliefs about media influences on others. So perceived media bias uh, refers to this phenomenon where people uh, tend to denounce information that contradicts their own beliefs. For example, um, perceived media bias is found to explain uh, selective exposure, and perceived uh, media beliefs about media influences on others um, also is widely documented in research. For example, the third person effect um, is a famous example of, um, of this category. So all the research these um, lay media theories has kind of has a latent assumption about people's sense of self. So it is a self that is autonomous, is free choosing, is self enhancing. So this self treats media as contained and tool-like. So again, this goes back to the main argument of my talk, which is when we are concerned with new media use, the preoccupation with the technological and information aspect of new media suggests a taken for granted uh, projection about the media user. This autonomous and contained self runs deep in burgeoning research on um, digital customization technologies, such as those used in social media, uh, which allows echo chambers to, to form. It also dominates the recent investigation in online misinformation as a way to account for the role of media in Trump's victory, for example. So against this um, backdrop, researching the brainwashing paranoia among the Chinese directs our attention back to the user, particularly the phenomenological reality of the user. So lay media theories especially how media is perceived in relation to the self in those theories, deserve more of our attention um, as we research digital media use. So in the present case, brainwashing paranoia amounts to lay theories that presume media influences on the self. So this is a scenario that's uh, largely absent uh, in the existing literature. So specifically, my oral history material and online archival analysis shows that such lay theories entail a distinct narrative about the self as being intertwined with media. Media here initially refers to the insidious Chinese media that's orchestrated by the state, but later for some of my interviewees, it expands to encompass media in general. So such lay theories um, usually form after people experience a commonly shared awakening stage uh, in the case of China, here's the quote. Uh, you can see that um, it says, you know, I bulog that side. I got to know about the GFW, <coughs> about the existence. So I knew about media censorship from very earlier on. But then at that time, my knowledge about government propaganda is not really linked to my sense of self, right? But this person says, um, after I read a lot and heard about all the Chinese liberals in the bloggers here, I gradually realize that what you are exposed to has already been censored. So he um, used this example where he saw the June 4th massacre and then he went back and checked and realized that you know all he's been told about, all he saw in media was like already shaped by some other forces. 
So in the end, he said, then I knew it was deliberate hidden. And I think besides this, many things are deliberately hidden. So this was a, a very stressful moment. Another interviewee uh, called this a huge mental blow. And this graph of Baidu search volume shows that the search request of Fentel, which means the term means like technically breaching the wall, um, it took off only after mid 2009, so which means my interviewees are among the Fentel pioneers, um, to put it in a historical context. So in the political liberal segment of the internet, the Great Firewall, uh, or simply the wall, is a frequent reference. So I'm talking about how kind of local cultural references would lead to this kind of lay media theories, right? So this wall oftentimes functions as a mental partition, an imagined boundary that creates insular compartments, the media environment inside versus the media environment outside. And the wall metaphor is a typical case of misplaced concreteness because the Chinese online theory system, what it does is really to block access to a tiny subset of foreign websites, not really a wall. But based on this wall perception, people came to believe that inside the information regime being molded by state censorship produces brainwashed subjects, including themselves. And escaping this regime to the world of uncensored, uncensored information as they understood it, um, was the only way to uh, approach the reality. So this understanding prompts my interviewees to deliberately find him to go across the wall. And there are lots of prison break type of portrayals of Fan Tiang, such as this one. I, so this is on Twitter. Also, the site was blocked by the, by the Great Firewall. So this person, this Chinese user said, um, I got over, I almost broke my neck, climbing over the wall without my shoes lost or my, my pants torn. I was awakening to the fresh air on the other side, sitting on top of the, the wall. I took a look back, I was safe for the moment, and he had this picture to kind of show the kind of mental space he's in, being able to get into this new environment that he can you know, fully absorb. So he did, here's a quote from a long-term uh, <coughs> practitioner. Um, long-time distortion of these marks on objects, and I'm thinking too. I remember when I first went down, seeing news reports divergent from those inside the wall, my primary feeling was repugnance. As Fan Town becomes my daily routine, how I feel now completely differs from them. I rarely follow news inside the wall anymore. To think of it, didn't my initial repugnance signify distorted thinking? So I should emphasize that Fan Town procedures can be torturous, very tedious, and the speed very slow, so it's not a pleasurable way to browse the web. But the quote also makes it clear that Fan Tiang's to seek information is not psychologically pleasurable either. Yet oriented by their particular main media theories, these people gladly endure all this. Along the way, both their online practices and political outlooks have transformed. So then, um, after half to one year, 24 out of my 26 interviewees stopped their Fan Tiang routines because the initial excitement over discovery subsided. They found that um, they found it difficult to relocate interesting things outside the wall, but after they returned, how they engaged with the inside, that is the Chinese internet, had changed fundamentally. So some believe that after a period of violently purging themselves, they took care of the brainwashing. All they do now is to reject mainstream messages. But theoretically, this signals, a sig a signals kind of a return to a contained self, right? Because these, what these people developed was a Chinese dissident version of perceived media bias in mainstream media, something that's been observed ethnographically in non other non-democratic societies like Russia. But more of my interviewees retain their brainwashing paranoia is really a sense of epistemic anxiety. Uh, for example, one interviewee says, um, the typical manifestations of thoroughly brainwashed persons include denial of being brainwashed, and the belief that they can completely undo the brainwashing they've been receiving since childhood. Seriously, who among us can got rid of the residue poison completely? Uh, it is good enough if one can seal it from attacking with one's uh, internal force. So he uses language from martial arts novels uh, where you find lots of leg legendary cases of um, lifelong struggles like this. And to cope with such epistemic anxiety, my interviewees told me in great detail the kind of measures they developed to evaluate and assemble information. Uh, many took what I call a network corroboration approach to search, compare, filter things on 
uh, multiple website venues within, um, like, within the Chinese internet. So for some, um, they, the way they look at media in general has changed. For example, this one said, on the other side of the wall, uh, for example, Size by Falun Gong, so I think Peter mentioned this group as well, it's a religious group that was cracked down by Chinese government. Uh, speak definitely for Falun Gong, says, uh, run by Murdoch, speak definitely for Murdoch, and was outside the public <coughs> truth. In fact, I think in this world, especially for matters regarding people and society, there's no truth. I believe at best in triangulating, counterbalancing different sources. What you see inside the wall is perhaps the sanctioning of one voice. Beside the wall, multiple voices may prosper, which may be more chaotic, not necessarily closer to reality. So this is a realization that all media representation are organizing according to a particular ideological leaning or more broadly attitudes. And this means not only the Chinese individuals <coughs> who stabilize their own self in the media environment, in the habits, um, they further believe that there is no reality the self can access through media. Uh, what one needs then is to actively weave a reality with the best possible material. And this type of lay media theory led to increased appreciation of concrete descriptions as opposed to uh, judgment or sentiments. So here we see several cases of deliberate cross-ideological exposure. So as uh, interviewee C says, I don't want to be, or I don't want to miss out certain things. Being carried away by the liberals um, is always my fear. Subscribing to alternative sources sometimes helps me weigh the problem differently. So interviewees like C went a step further, right? They, they consciously kept a critical distance from liberal-oriented online information that they were naturally drawn to, and they actively worked against the anticipated tendency of letting their value preferences predetermine their opinions about discrete issues. So they, they would show me their blog or Weibo subscriptions, where uh, this <coughs> contained prominent uh, liberal-leaning outlets, but also nationalist and statist outlets that they picked up if those outlets provide some solid facts and analysis um, based on how they, how they evaluate it. So finally, going back to my opening highlight on censored abundance, which I uh, used to characterize the Chinese uh, web uh, internet. So the Chinese internet is a productive research site in the second study for a different reason than in the first study. So here, the awareness of censorship has configured the local phenomenological reality about media in China letting certain kind of lay media theories to emerge. And then meanwhile, the information abundance provides capacious material for users to navigate and appropriate in light of their lay media theories. So in this way, the dynamics surrounding lay media theories, uh, especially with this um, specific perception about the connection between media and the self, um, we observed in China are comparable and generalizable to a broader context. So in sum, with this study, I argue that to better understand digital media use, we need to take into account the phenomenological dimension, specifically the sense of the autonomous contained self is not really a universal psychological inclination, but culturally and socially produced. Um, as the Chinese case shows, when lay media theories involves the sense of self as already and always um, constituted by the mediated environment, people's media practices may be oriented differently in the high choice um, media environment. So that's the end of it. Thank you. So, Angela, it, it feels to me like not only is this a really helpful set of concepts for understanding the Chinese internet, but this experience of understanding people feeling like they're coming out of being brainwashed, mm -hmm and then finding their way through a media environment has enormous implications for those of us who are thinking about how do we reach audiences that have lost trust in mainstream media, how do we reach audiences who have gone down the various different rabbit holes that speakers have been documenting today. Based on what you know with a very different population than the population you've studied in China, are there lessons learned or the things that you want to share with people who are sort of thinking about how to combat disinformatia and, and how to help some of these readers who are uh, really getting stuck in these in these sub communities of conspiracy theory. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think the main point I want to uh, bring forward with this the first is that um, so mapping or better understanding how the technological infrastructure, the, the fascinating evolving infrastructure 
um, is helpful and to map the information landscape is also helpful, but we really need to also focus on the way that people really understand and approach this fast yeah. evolving environment. And another thing that, uh, that occurred to me after I listened to lots of talk today is that um, we are developing more and more like fine approach to categorize misinformation, disinformation, malinformation. But this kind of categorization is still to, to assume that the, the user is this very detached person there and you have an objective categorization and then you're able to, again, further map the information environment in this way to, or to understand user behavior based on this categorization. But the kind of brainwashing paranoia brings forward a connection that what's really important is how users not only understand whether the user is credible, but to understand how themselves have been formed in relation to the media environment. So as long as they develop very specific understanding between the relationship um, of themselves and the media. So that kind of variable is a, a very understudied variable in the current uh, kind of research effort to understand the entire uh, phenomenon. So I think even for survey research or maybe experiments, maybe something can be created to really focus on that kind of a, a perceived connection yeah. between self and media. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions for Angela before we uh, go and have questions on the case? I don't know how how well you would really be able to tell this, but I just wonder, <coughs> like in my talk where I say it seems like among our American subjects, people that are like more analytic thinkers are better at telling if you know, do you feel like the people that are <coughs> that haven't sort of gone over the wall, mm -hmm. like do you have a sense or like a guess about how people that are sort of more analytic critical thinkers are are they more likely to question the sort of limited media? I think a very uh, productive way to answer the question, which is not a direct answer, is that um, the interviewees I had, and who happen to be the readers of that, like semi different style, they are they tend to be the very well educated urban kind of Chinese population. Mm -hmm. So, and the, the the strength of a qualitative study is to understand processes which are not necessarily representative of the whole population. So I would say that we're using this very tiny kind of a maybe analytically prone population in China to highlight the processes that we under study. But this by no means represents how Chinese uh, average user in Chinese would approach it. Yes, please. Uh, I thought there was a really interesting contrast between both of your presentations and kind of the final conclusion of how or who to study that um, one of your key takeaways was it's important to study the average person. And then your presentation focused so much more on individual experiences. And I'm wondering if in your research or in your collaboration, you thought of any ways to reconcile the two. Yeah, um, so actually my first study is a macro level study, right? Because uh, even when we published that great firewall study, of uh, people who raise issues with it is like, we always know there are Chinese that are going abroad, the, like uh, going up over the wall for that. And we, we were, what we were saying back then was that because this is macro pattern, and on a macro level, uh, it's not really much uh, explained by the, the, the existence of the great firewall. So how to reconcile that? Um, I don't really have a ready answer. Um, all I have is the qualitative evidence kind of is consistent with the macro in a way that even for those analytically prone thinker, they ended up having a different understanding of the self, but they did not really continue to breach the wall, mm -hmm. right? It's more like a kind of a kind of cultural epistemic kind of thing that pushes them to do something, experience something, and reach the understanding. Then they go back to the Chinese internet, use this new understanding to navigate their domestic environment. Thanks for your question. I may just chip in here that I think a lot of anecdotal sort of comments that we got from a lot of Westerners about that firewall study, and especially those who have spent considerable time in China, many of them reported that maybe it was they who were more constrained in their experiences, online experiences within China because of the firewall than the Chinese who they were cohabiting with in you know university or office or institutions so thank you all so much thank you, thank you. Um, so look here
here, here's what we've got at this point. We've got a, a little reception outside. We're going to have some drinks, chips, for people to just sort of catch up and talk to one another. There's no formal dinner plans, although I'm sure people will slide out to all sorts of places around Kendall. Tomorrow we are getting together uh, fairly bright and early, around 9 a.m., and uh, I'm hoping you're going to join me because we're going to try to do some mapping and, and just raise one of the big questions that we want to be talking about and sort of asking in this space. And I think part of what's so wonderful about this session is that it just makes it clear how big those questions are. They really need to be questions that bring us into the cognitive sciences, doing actual experiments to find out what works and to sort of test our assumptions behind this. Ideally, these are experiments that do not assume that the internet is English speaking, that it's based in the US, that it's based around Facebook, but kind of recognize that there's incredible diversity of what's out there. And that ideally we'd want to be looking through, in part because we may actually find these models uh, for how we resolve some of these crises that show up epistemically uh, otherwise. So um, I just want to thank everybody for, for hanging on a really long and sort of content packed day. Um, and a, a day on which I'm guessing like one out of four people is dying of a cold in one fashion or another. <laughs> so thank you for all hanging in there and for some great conversations.